Kalmera, good morning to all. Uh, it's a pleasure to have with me uh, Thomas Wieser. He's somebody who has lived through the Greek saga from the very beginning, not until the end. He managed to retire before the end. Uh, maybe he knows something we don't know. Um, so let me start with a question that I think probably everybody in this room wants to ask you. I know you don't want to hurt Mr. Varoufakis's feelings, but what is the actual cost of the Varoufakis episode for Greece? Right. Uh, there are very many uh, different ways and means how to calculate uh, such costs. And uh, if you are an accountant or a bookkeeper uh, and just throw one euro into the box and the next euro into the box, then you arrive at the cost uh, for recapitalizing the banks and uh, all, all of that. But the true cost, of course, uh, of uh, the crisis uh, is the very steep drop in GDP. Uh, and Greece has lost a quarter of its output. And that would be a not so huge cost if you lose it in one year and next year by some miracle, because God has been acting, you jump up to the original GDP and then you start growing uh, uh, into, into nirvana. But the truth, of course, is that your growth starts at the lower level. And will you ever catch up the 25%? Uh, I would doubt it. So what you have to calculate is where would you, if you had, if you can reboot back to, let's say, 2005 or to, well, bad year. Uh, let's, let's assume you reboot back to uh, 2014 or 15, and then you have a growth uh, path up to 2050, and compare that with where you are now in the growth path up to 2050, you see, the amount of output that is lost, the amount of employment that you do not have, uh, and uh, that's, that's the true cost. That's the true cost. And uh, that's why I would say the cost of uh, one uh, amount of GDP, which uh, in uh, Greece is around 200 billion, uh, is a safe uh, estimate. Some people would say it's a conservative estimate. Okay. I want to ask you a few things about the past and then try to look forward, you know, what's, what's going to happen after the end of the program and so on. Do you think it was a mistake not to have a debt uh, restructuring in the beginning of the program? And whose decision was that? When people ask me, is there one thing that you regret, uh, apart from not having married my wife earlier, uh, <laughs> I asked you politely, as you <laughs> I should have married her 10 years, even, even 10 years earlier. Uh, but uh, apart from that, uh, the need for debt restructuring and the possibility to have a debt restructuring at the beginning of the program is what would have helped us most. And then people say, now why didn't you do it? Well, we were in the midst of a huge global conflagration uh, where we simply did not know what would happen to not only the Greek banking system, not only to the European banking system, but to the global financial system if all of a sudden you have a massive uh, debt write-down. Uh, and the same argument uh, goes for Ireland. So it was not only Greece, it was Ireland as well, uh, and, uh, and Portugal then, where people simply ultimately didn't dare to take this very decisive step. And secondly, uh, the monetary union had been built on the assumption that there could be no stop of access to capital markets. Uh, there could essentially be no balance of payment crisis. And that is why there was the no bailout clause and we didn't even have any instruments that we did for the outs. We didn't have any instruments to do anything. So in the middle of all of this rupture and hellfire and brimstone and everything, we not only had to deal with the crisis, but we had to deal with many other member states and the absence within the treaty of any decent instruments. So uh, I very much regret that we didn't have, back in 2010, a significant debt write-down. But if I zoom myself back into 2010, and in the middle of this huge financial crisis, we still wouldn't have it. What people love to forget is that in 2012, 
we had the largest, already, the largest debt, forgiveness debt write down uh, ever uh, uh, in, in, in global economic history. So the debt burden of the Greek sovereign and the debt burden of the Greek people is considerably lower already now than it would be had we not done what we did in 2012. But the next time such a terrible crisis strikes, we will have the instruments and then there will be, you know, but we can't rewind history. Now, um, there's been a lot of controversy about the IMF and its role. Um, so I want to ask you whose decision was to get the, the fund involved and was it a mistake looking back at it? I'm not going to ask you whether you want to go on vacation with Paul Thompson next summer, but you know, that's it. Some Danes are my best friends. <laughs> um, there was a huge debate on this issue uh, eight years back, and there still is, of course. All of these discussions in turning the ESM into a European Monetary Fund revolve around the central question, can we do stuff alone, and should we do stuff alone? And even within the German cabinet, there was a very intensive discussion. Should we have the IMF on board? Should we not have the IMF on board? And both sides of the argument uh, had uh, legitimate views. Some were of the opinion, Jean-Claude Trichet, for example, who said, look, let's not show the outside world that we can't manage this by ourselves. This is something that we need to deal with en famille. And a number of uh, very important uh, members of the German cabinet, uh, some of them sitting in the German parliament today, were of the same opinion. And uh, then there was a significant debate, and in the end, uh, the, the German government decided we need to have the IMF on board. Why? Well, there's a very good reason, which I think I totally would accept, uh, we also were not equipped to run such an adjustment program in terms of how do you structure it, uh, do we have the personnel, uh, and all of that. So uh, you could regard the IMF at that stage also as a consultant. A second reason was uh, that people were not quite sure of how the European Commission would be conducting such uh, program negotiations. And that is the more, let's say, uh, Calvinist uh, attitude uh, uh, towards the institutional setup, you need some outside, not only a consultant, uh, but you need some uh, uh, outside taskmaster who makes sure that you continue to behave. It's a bit like a godfather. And if we uh, just look at the discussion, should the IMF have been in or not have been in, uh, we have to also consider that other people's behaviors changed because the IMF was in. So we can't just subtract or add the IMF. Maybe the commission would have been totally different had the IMF been absent from the program. Maybe the ESM would have been different. Maybe all of us would have been different. So it's, it's very difficult to answer uh, completely. But in the end, uh, once the IMF was in on the first Greek program, there you go. And it got hardwired into the attitude of very many uh, parliamentarians uh, who now talk about the IMF as if they knew exactly what they're talking about, um, and in Holland, and in Austria, and in Germany, and in others, uh, uh, in other countries. They've got very, very strict opinions, but don't ask me how informed uh, they are. On the other hand, you've got very uh, strict opinions in Greece, or in uh, Portugal, uh, in Italy, uh, that bringing the IMF in was a catastrophe, which I do not believe is true. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what would have happened, but uh, it was, in the end, it was nearly unavoidable. And if it had been avoidable, uh, maybe all of us would have developed in a different manner. Let me ask you whether Brexit was a real possibility, a real threat, or whether this was Soible bluffing. Well, we had two episodes of potential uh, Brexit. One was in 2012, um, where uh, there was a push, and don't personalize it on Schäuble, uh, and don't uh, uh, personalize it on Germany. There were a number of uh, northern member states 
whose attitude I would summarize as follows. Monetary union was built on a certain set of rules, and if uh, people don't stick to the rules, uh, then either you change the rules or you change the composition of monetary union. Uh, and the push for Grexit in 2012 came from uh, there. And finally, in the autumn of 2012, uh, this attitude had completely disappeared around October 2012. So that was very much led by some other member states. Uh, in 2015, we had uh, a resurgence of this. And uh, I, I think that the 2015 episode was much, much closer to Grexit becoming real. But in my perception, it was not the Germans who were pushing it. It was more the parts of the Greek government that were provoking it. And uh, in the end, we had, uh, in the summer of uh, 2015, uh, this episode uh, which ended with the European Council and the compromise and uh, all of that, uh, which you know very well. But the tactic of parts of the Greek government from February, January, February 2015 up to July 2015 had been uh, to provoke uh, the scepter of Brexit. Um, and as such, I saw especially the Germans merely responding to that and not actively pushing for it. But I would say in the summer of 2015, uh, we were that close to this really happening, as all of you know. Where was the chancellor on this? And what was the, the role of the US administration back then on this? Was it as critical as we hear it was? If you ask me what the role of the I take it you mean the German Chancellor? Yes. Okay. Not the Austrian. Not the Austrian. For a moment, for a moment, I was thinking. I, I was thinking that you thought the Austrian Chancellor had a position on that. Uh, I know you have a very important role as a, you know. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I can just hypothesize, of course, because uh, it's uh, not something that I could know or uh, would know. But my assumption was that uh, the uh, German government was, by and large, uh, following one uh, strategy and one tactical uh, approach, uh, which held uh, right through all of the meetings that we had at uh, finance minister level. And I am quite sure that the chancellor was backing what the German finance ministry was uh, propagating. And that led to a certain and pass uh, at the level of finance ministers, which is very good because in such uh, historically momentous moments, those are not decisions that you would want a finance minister to take. And this is not a decision that any finance minister would be willing, comfortable or willing to take. So it was shifted upstairs uh, to the prime ministers and it's not as if Madame Merkel then entered the room and said, uh, all of this, what the finance ministers have been producing there is, is rubbish. Uh, it, it took a hell of a long time to come to a conclusion. And uh, so I would think that uh, the German government went into this whole episode, as many other governments, uh, with a fairly clear uh, attitude and given how both sides of the debate uh, and uh, uh, both camps argued uh, and uh, their positions developed. In the end, on that Monday uh, morning, we emerged with, with something uh, which let me pay uh, when I got here yesterday in Euro and not in New Drachma, for which I'm very glad. And I think the, the US uh, administration had always been extremely engaged uh, in these uh, questions of the Greek program. I actually found uh, our colleagues in the US Treasury uh, immensely knowledgeable, sometimes more knowledgeable than many of the institutions uh, that were actually uh, involved uh, in the reviews and uh, the program. And uh, I know that uh, for a fact that the Secretary of the Treasury uh, was on the phone to 
uh, Greek finance ministers and prime ministers to other EU finance ministers uh, very, very often. There were weeks when uh, Jack Lou would call Jeroen Dijsselbloem five times a week. Uh, and I also know that uh, the, the President of the United States was also actively intervening uh, in these debates. Now, finance ministers uh, suffer, of course, from a defamation professionnelle. They always think of finance and economics, but never of geopolitics. But that is something uh, what uh, some would accuse them of not being very political, but that's uh, not me. Uh, but that is, of course, what the U.S. administration, uh, they, were, they were looking at the bigger picture. They were looking at politics and geopolitics. And uh, I think that's a right thing uh, to do, but it should not be an, ex geopolitics should not be an excuse uh, for running bad economic policies because somebody will pick up the mess. I want to finish this, the part about the past with a couple of questions. One is, was it unfair uh, when the Europeans didn't provide debt relief to Greece when Greece achieved primary surplus for the first time? Uh, there was a clear agreement. There was a clear agreement. Um, the first, Greece would get debt relief after the completion of the first review after the primary surplus had been certified by Eurostat. So we were sitting in Brussels and uh, I was reading in Katimerini about the good primary surplus in, uh, in Greece. Uh, but Katimerini, you want to say something? Μπορείτε να κάνετε λίγο ησυχία πίσω, παρακαλώ, γιατί... Ευχαριστώ. Thank you. You, you do it better than me. Uh, so, but we figured, where's Eurostat? Um, and uh, so we waited for uh, the notification of the Greeks and for the uh, attestation of uh, Eurostat, uh, which came in due course and certified a primary surplus, but we never finished the damn review. So, had the Greek government uh, been decisive enough to just finish the next review, then the debt relief would have, as agreed, uh, been, been forthcoming of that, I'm totally sure. Le okay. Let me get to the next part of this question, which is, there's a lot of frustration uh, among the, the opposition with Mr. Venizelos, Ms. Samaras, and others, because they say there's a bit of a double standard. You were pushing them to fire civil servants back then. Μπορούμε μήπως να εισχάσουμε. Ευχαριστώ. Anyway, must be a family crisis going back there. Um, so, um, yeah. Better than a, yeah. cheaper than a financial crisis, um, usually. So they say there was a double standard because you were forcing the government then to uh, fire civil servants. Mm. Now this is going on, there's no real sort of, you know, negative reaction. So was this a real double standard or just bad luck? I don't think that there were any uh, double standards. It's uh, many of uh, the reforms uh, that, if one looks back over the first and the second and the third program, were considered necessary uh, in order to uh, let's see, uh, for Greece to regain access uh, to uh, markets, many of these reforms had indeed been uh, undertaken already under uh, the uh, previous Greek governments. So, obviously not to be repeated. If you ask people from the present government uh, if the institutions and uh, if uh, the other member states uh, had been unreasonably uh, uh, lenient, they'd probably fall down laughing. Uh, there's always a subjective uh, way of uh, looking at it, uh, but my experience in 2015, 2016, 2017 was not uh, that any of the reforms that were asked of the Greek government were considered uh, to, be, to be easy ones. Uh, there is always the uh, accusation, which, is, uh, which I hear in, in Austria even more than in Greece, and in Germany even more than in Greece. There's always the accusation that uh, why the hell uh, did uh, everybody insist on such abrupt fiscal tightening? And my answer to that is uh, that uh, in, in the year 
uh, leading up to that crisis, uh, the uh, fiscal deficit had exploded. And in the end, we know uh, that it was at 15.6, 15.4, 15.6% of GDP. If you keep that up for four and a half years, debt doubles. Uh, if people start talking to me about uh, a gradual Keynesian withdrawal of fiscal stimulus, just say, give me a break. Uh, where, where does that leave the country? Uh, totally indebted uh, and uh, you will be unable uh, to get on an even keel uh, again. And despite pumping 15 and a half percent worth of GDP into the economy, if I remember correctly, the Greek economy wasn't growing at uh, uh, more than 2% or something in that year. So where did all of that money evaporate? So you have to take very decisive action, which hurts, of course. Uh, if one had been more decisive in one fell swoop, then one could have probably gradually uh, 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 loosened up uh, again. To get back to your question, uh, I, I can't remember any discussion, any review, uh, which was perceived by, the, by any of the Greek governments uh, as being easy. Uh, there was a tendency to regard that what was asked of other parties as easy and what one was asking of them as difficult. So it's very much in the eye of the beholder. If we look forward to the end, uh, towards the end of the program, do you think Greece can make it without a precautionary line of some sort? Uh, my job was to be a practical person uh, and not, uh, not regard this as a normative question, but is it uh, likely, is it possible, uh, will it happen? And the message I was picking up from uh, the Greek government was that we want total independence, uh, no new program. The message I was picking up from quite a number of uh, parliaments uh, in the north was no new program. And we would argue and say, look, a precautionary program is not something that's a program that disperses, et cetera, et cetera. It's just there as a safety net. You're not lying in the hammock. It's a safety net. And they say, uh, they must have read it somewhere, a program is a program is a program. I see, but look at, the, look at the adjectives. So, unlikely, highly unlikely that there would be a precautionary uh, program. Life is always easier if you have uh, a safety net under you, but any safety net also comes with uh, a certain degree of conditionality. You've got to keep to conditions if you want to safely fall into the net. So. If you ask me, is it possible? Of course it would be possible, it is conceivable. Is it likely? I very much doubt if it's gonna happen. Well, I guess the other side of this question is, if we run out of money again, will there be any money from our partners? I can hardly think of Greece running out of money in the short and uh, the medium term. Uh, Firstly, the disbursement plan up to the end of the program uh, will provide uh, Greece with a very significant cash buffer. Uh, Greece has started reaccessing capital markets. It's building up a yield curve, obviously, and that's good economics at costs that are uh, above uh, what the German Bund has to pay. Uh, there is a certain uh, risk factor uh, in pricing uh, in capital markets, fortunately. Um, and uh, there will be debt-related measures at the end of the program, more likely in June uh, than in August, because in August people want to be in Antiparos. So, not the Greeks, the others. Uh, so, uh, there will be very, very little cash needs. Uh, Greece is has committed to run a primary surplus of 3.5% in the medium term. So what would one need the cash for? Not for running the day-to-day -day business of the government. And I would say, in order to uh, roll over debt, uh, well, you need to access markets and that will uh, that is happening. And there's not very much debt that needs to be rolled over in the 
short and, and the medium run. Um, so, the Greek banks. There's a stress test uh, coming up. Uh, we will see what happens there. I'm uh, fairly confident uh, that, quite confident that no additional money will be necessary, but that's something that's gonna happen before the end of the program. So the ESM program is around until mid-August um, and uh, there's adequate uh, room for maneuver within the program. But from what I've seen uh, from the banks, things have gotten better uh, over, the, uh, over the recent past. Now, we're getting into an election cycle. Uh, I don't know when the election is going to happen, but we start our election cycles rather early in this country. And there's going to be a lot of pressure on the government um, to get rid of some of the essential parts of the program. For example, reforms in the labor market, because this is something this government doesn't believe in. If they did that, would that affect the confidence of the markets, you think? My belief in the intelligence of markets uh, has suffered uh, uh, certain blows over the last uh, decade. Uh, after I had uh, left university as a naive economist, um, if I just look at the pricing of Greek government uh, uh, bonds in 2000, Six, seven, eight, nine, um, goodness. That's what's called imperfect foresight. Uh, but maybe they foresaw the bailout, so maybe, maybe markets were more intelligent. So, uh, I think there's comparatively little risk uh, involved. Uh, now, a lot of people here in in Greece, they feel that you know the tax rates are unbearable, uh, and it's a real impediment to, to further growth, investments, and so on. The question is, if you had another government with a real reformist agenda, could they strike a deal for a lower primary surplus target, which would mean lower tax rates? Is that something realistic, or is this sort of Pollyanna land? My answer to your first question somehow uh, uh, drifted away into La La Land. Uh, before I got really finished. Uh, uh, I'll answer both at, at the same time. Um, I think there is, uh, th there will be a long debate uh, about uh, what the uh, conditions uh, uh, will be uh, connected around uh, debt relief uh, towards the end of the program. That will go on for a couple of years. And there will be certain conditions involved, but we don't know yet which conditions they will be. Uh, but I'm quite sure that one of the conditions, what, one of the conditions uh, will be uh, about the primary surplus. Uh, if labor market uh, standards and other issues are in that package, that's very, very difficult uh, to foresee. It will not be like uh, in a review that we had 80 or 100 or 110 actions. There will be maybe five important issues. Milestones. Uh, something like that. And part of the debt relief uh, will not come in August 2018, uh, but will be given, a small part of that will be given uh, over time 2018, 19, 20. And that will probably depend on how this government and the next government Change of mic. Thanks very much. Uh, how, how these agreed milestones uh, are, are kept to. So, uh, will a next government be able to negotiate down uh, the fiscal surplus, the primary surplus of 3.5%? Uh, I very, very much doubt it. I think that will, uh, for the medium term, uh, up until, let's say, 2021, 20, 2022, uh, by, by and large, uh, I just bellowed, uh, by and large, stay with us. Uh, certain other uh, elements uh, can, of course, change, and that are those elements uh, which would not be part of this, let's say, five item package uh, connected to the program period. So there's no room for a sort of new grand bargain, even with the change of German government? I see the real defining feature of the
the Grand Coalition in Germany versus other forms of government uh, in uh, what they negotiate, how in Brussels on deepening uh, economic and monetary union, uh, further reforms, uh, increases to banking union and the like. Uh, but I do not believe uh, that there would, would be a good difference I, I do not believe that they would uh, uh, start fiddling around with some of the parameters of the program uh, or some of the parameters of the uh, post program period. If you look at the present, you know, the, the, the German government up to uh, October, they also, uh, I think it was, it was quite clear that they wanted uh, a dignified end uh, of the program in. Uh, the summer of 2018 and a decent post-program uh, period. So there was no uh, sign of any attitude that would say, I will use this to squeeze some more out of it. But uh, as, as there is a uh, prime ministerial agreement dating back to 2015 and subsequent agreements uh, on, on the primary surplus in the medium term, I think that's, uh, that's here to stay. Grand bargains, uh, maybe on other issues, on more structural issues, things uh, connected to the financing of the economy and the like. Okay, two last questions as we're running out of time. One is, there seems to be a love fest between the Commission especially and the current government and Alexis Tsipras. Explain to us how this happened, how long will it last? You've been through, you've been through this before. Well, uh, that depends on your electoral cycle. Uh, Will the present government go to the polls first uh, before the uh, mandate of this commission runs out uh, in uh, mid-2019 or not? And after that, it's a different game. But the commission, one of the purposes of the commission is to be loved. <laughs> okay, we'll go through group therapy next time. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me finish by asking you, I want, I want to end this with a story. I mean, tell us one moment, one episode that really sticks out of your mind from this whole Greek saga, as you said. As I said, you've been with this from the very, very beginning. So the one moment, the one story that really sticks out in your mind. And which I can tell. Yes. <laughs> you can meet us tonight for drinks. And, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> Most of the things that stick to my mind, I can't tell. Um, Nearly none of them. You really uh, need to confess, so go ahead. I mean, you can. <laughs> We're ready for this. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll not be too precise, but I uh, do remember that in early 2015, uh, a Greek person uh, <laughs> connected, not unconnected to the government, uh, came to me and said, why do we have to go through this whole rigmarole uh, of conditionality and so on and so forth, you know exactly that we're not going to do anything and in the end you'll give us the money. <laughs> and that's when I started to realize that we're in a different uh, ball game than we had been uh, previously. And uh, that is how, it was not uh, the finance minister. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, that, that was extremely interesting because somehow it totally transcended uh, our, let's say, joint working methods. And that was a real, was interesting. But I knew more or less, from that moment onwards, I knew more or less uh, how things would unfold. And as I said, I'm very glad that I didn't have to paint drachma yesterday. <laughs>